Father in heaven, we sure do need you. Thank you for how you've been here. And I just ask that you would speak through me in this time, that you would be lifted up, that we'd all be drawn to you, that we would see your glory here today, and that we would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. Imagine that you are a ruler of a nation. It's all you've ever known, big or small decisions, whatever you say goes ever since you were a child. You don't answer to anybody, everybody answers to you. You have the power. You can condemn, you can promote, you can bless, you can curse, and all want to be on your good side. That is until the Roman Empire decides that they want your territory to be part of their territory. After a long struggle, you find that your numbers, your tactics, your resources are no match for theirs. No matter how many times you fight them off, they just keep coming back. They will not be denied. So rather than prolonging the inevitable and losing more lives, you switch gears, surrender, and throw yourselves on their mercy. You and your family are corralled along with your best and brightest, all your possessions. You're hauled off to Rome as trophies of the empire. One morning after what feels like an eternity in detention in some seriously rough conditions, you're dressed in dark clothes and you're chained and you're led under the rising sun to the entrance of the city. You are about to experience your very first and very last Roman triumph where the whole city of Rome will be celebrating for a day or more the godlike general that conquered you and your people. You stand there, waiting, seeing wave after wave of spectacles enter the city. Honored men of Rome applauded as they walked through the streets. Trumpeters cheered as they play the victory songs. Your country's treasures and exotic animals displayed everywhere. White bulls and oxen are led in front of you to be sacrificed to their gods. And then it's your turn. You are prodded into the city to walk at the head of your family and your people destined to be the stars in the entertainment that night in the Colosseum. All this to celebrate the glory of the Roman general and his army. They're celebrated in the streets with songs of victory and praise. This is the kind of picture that Paul paints in Romans or um, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2.14 when he writes, Thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession. It's kind of a troubling picture, isn't it? <laughs> so troubling that the reformer John Calvin and many other translators over the past few hundred years left that whole part of being captives out of the verse. It didn't fit their theology, so instead of following the plain reading of the Greek, they pictured Paul as part of the victorious army who's always led in triumph in Christ because it made more sense to them. But captivity is actually the point that Paul is going after because his critics have been sending him hate mail saying that you can't write to the Corinthian people like you do with so much authority when you have the kind of life that you have. I mean, look at all your hardships. Obviously, God isn't as with you as he could be, if you know what I mean. But back at the beginning of the letter, Paul wrote of his hardships, we were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts, we felt the death sentence. His opponents were gossiping and saying that if this guy is really serving God, there's no way he'd be facing so many hardships. There wouldn't be so much struggle. God's blessing is not on him. They claimed that his message did not match his life. Paul responds that no, no, his life exactly represents his message. It's not meant to glorify him, it's meant to glorify Jesus. General Jesus Christ, who met him on the road to Damascus. 
Paul, who used to be called Saul, was fighting Jesus, as you remember, and was on his way to persecute and kill more of Christ's followers when Jesus stopped him in his tracks and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. Now get up and go to the city, and you will be told what you must do. After this vision, Paul could not see for days. The Jesus Paul had tried to erase from history, defeated him, and now Paul was in bondage to him and taking orders as a captive. This is exactly in line with Paul's gospel. And some of his favorite names for himself in the epistles are servant, captive, bondservant, and slave. Now, if you're anything like me, this doesn't sit that well with you. I love to be free. I don't like to be confined. You may wonder with me and John Calvin how it makes any sense for Paul to be praising God that he is his captive. His original readers must have felt the same way. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Just let that bother you for a little bit. One of the major elements in these Roman victory parades was the incense. The whole city would be drenched with the smell, but it meant very different things depending on how you were related to the winners. If you were part of the winning side, it was invigorating, it was life, it was celebration, but if you were on the losing side, it would make you want to throw up. It would make you sick because you know what the result of this celebration is going to be. It's going to be a humiliating death by animals or ripping apart or something or slavery at the very best. It gets a little more complicated as we go on because Paul says that he is a captive to Christ and Jesus uses him to spread the fragrance of the knowledge of him. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says, For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death, to the other the fragrance of life. In Christ, we speak with sincerity like men sent from God. So he's being led to death as a captive, while at the same time, he's pleasing to God and he's representing the message of Christ accurately in the world, in his life and his preaching. It's a smell some love and are attracted to, and others are repulsed by it. Did anyone notice as you came in the scratch and sniff posters? Did anyone actually do a little sniff? Um, One is like a chocolate pudding smell, could remind you of your grandmother's house or someone who gave you pudding while you watched cartoons. Or, and the other one, I don't think you have any associations with it. It's like protein powder and onion powder mixed together. It's meant to be nasty. It is nasty. While talking to Enoch uh, earlier this week, I realized that we have really strong associations and reactions to smells, don't we? Because they're so tied to our our memories and our experiences. This is how a smell can be as good as chocolate pudding to one person and as bad as onion protein powder to another person. It's the association, the memories that you have attached to them. A perfume I once really liked became awkward for me when I broke up with the girl that wore it, and then my sister got the same kind. <laughs> it's called Love Spell, anybody? The scent, the scent didn't change at all. It's the same scent, the same chemicals, whatever, but my relationship to it had changed. Paul's ministry was the smell of Jesus in the world, and some were drawn while others were repulsed because of their relationship to Christ and who he was. Paul then goes on to compare his ministry that represents Christ with that of Moses, who is definitely a hero to the enemies of Paul. Guess what he says? And I think this is super bold. He says, God has given us a more effective ministry than Moses. What is he saying? Did God come up with a better plan by the time Paul came along? Was there something wrong with his plan A? The same God gave both ministries, didn't he? 
Paul basically said that the glory of his ministry so far exceeded that of Moses that it was like Moses didn't have any glory at all. But when you read the account of Moses' story, you can see that he sat with God face to face and was glowing from the encounter. He glowed so brightly that the Israelites could look at his face about as well as we can stare at the sun and not go blind. Seems pretty glorious, right? Paul was saying that his ministry was more glorious because of the effectiveness of it. Not because of the glowing or not glowing, but because of the effectiveness of it. Moses received the Ten Commandments, the letters engraved on stone from God, but it resulted in death, condemnation, and no glory compared to Paul's ministry. But Paul's ministry brought life and righteousness and a glory that surpasses and lasts. Same God with the same purpose to reach people, but much different results. Why the difference? Was Paul holier? Was he closer to God? No. And the difference was the people's receptivity to God and his ministry. Was it a smell that led to life or a smell that led to death? What was their relationship to it? Listen to Paul's explanation in 2 Corinthians 3, 12 to 18. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we behave with great boldness. And not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from staring at the result of the glory that was made ineffective. But their minds were closed. For to this day, the same veil remains when they hear the old covenant read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. But until this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is present, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, reflecting the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the image, into the same image from one degree of glory to another, which is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So the Israelites were keeping God at arm's length. They didn't want to get close to him like he wanted to get close to them. Even though he showed himself to be a mighty savior, he delivered them from Egypt, led them through the sea on dry ground. They were afraid of him, didn't want to get close to him, and didn't want to receive him fully. They wanted Moses instead to be their their go-between, to be their intercessor. But even when Moses glowed with the glory of God, they asked him to cover his face. So he did, and the glory that would have changed everything was made of no effect. It was made ineffective by their choice. The law, the Ten Commandments, stayed external as something they tried to live up to and appease God by fulfilling rather than a changed heart they could have let God create in them. Now, this wasn't just a problem with the people in the days of Moses. It was also a problem in Paul's day, which is why he's writing about it. And I would even suggest that it is our problem as well. As Seventh-day Adventists, we pride ourselves on being people of the book. Thank you, first service, helping me out. We like phrases like sola scriptura. We see the Bible as the rule of faith and life. But check out this quote from E.M. Bounds. He says, says, We love orthodoxy. It is good. It is the best. It is the clean, clear-cut teaching of God's word. The trophy is won by truth in its conflict with error. But orthodoxy, clear and hard as crystal, suspicious and militant, may be but the letter, well-shaped, well-named, and well-learned, the letter which kills. Nothing is so dead as dead orthodoxy. Too dead to speculate, too dead to think, too dead to study, or to pray. Correct understanding doesn't lead to life in and of itself. When Paul said that the letter kills in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, I think he would also include his own epistles, along with the Ten Commandments and the Torah. If we only know the right answers, even if it's Jesus that's the right answer, if we only have it in our heads 
and don't let the truth touch our hearts, we will be like those of whom Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We grasp at a religion that we think that we can manage, and we close our hearts and minds to growth and expansion and transformation in Christ. We don't like it when people see things differently. We're, we're safe only for those who agree with us. We don't want any Pauls showing up and calling us to something deeper or more demanding, to a life of captivity. A veil is covering God's glory because we have covered it up. He hasn't changed, but we have limited him. Only Jesus can remove the veil and save us from ourselves. When we say yes to him, when we turn to him, he will draw us to himself. Amen? He will set us free from our fear of living the life he lived, where we lose our lives to find them. He will enable us to do this. And this was Paul's ex personal experience. He wasn't defeated by Jesus through force, though Jesus did intervene on the Damascus Road. He was defeated by Jesus' love and care for him, to reach out for him even while he was fighting against Christ. His flesh was captive to Christ, being led to total destruction, while his heart was coming to life through the Holy Spirit. When we look at Paul's hardships naturally from the outside, we don't want a life anything like his. We don't want to be captives because it leads to our destruction of self. But this is Paul's personal testimony about the experience. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Anywhere, in anything, with the Spirit, we have freedom. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Even if our physical body is wearing away, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light suffering is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Because we are not looking at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what we can see is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Everything changed for Paul the day he looked Jesus in the eye. I remember the first time I looked my wife in the eye for a period of time. It was actually the very first time that we met. Uh, we were both being taped for a video on the experiences of student missionaries. One of my friends was interviewing everybody. I was interviewed, and then she finally needed to be interviewed. And so I said, okay, we'll switch spots. I'll interview you. And then Deanne came in the room, and I said, I think I'll just keep interviewing. I think I'll just stay here. Um, after the interview, like months later when we were in a, a relationship, she told me that that was actually really weird, the way I looked so intently at her and listened so intently to her. She felt weird but I think it was actually the spark of our relationship. <laughs> she likes a little weirdness. <clears throat> Later on, I remember moments where we would intentionally not say anything, but just look in each other's eyes. Again, it was kind of weird and felt strange, but it also felt good, and it, it bonded us. I don't know where we got the idea. It was actually... Uh, really cool. And I just saw a video yesterday about like these different couples who did it. Some were acquaintances. Some had been married like 50 years or something. And they all had this really interesting experience staring in each other's eyes for four minutes. It would help us to connect. It affected our relationship. It brought intimacy. I believe the verse I'm about to share with you is the key to appreciating the aroma of Christ, to finding freedom and hope through his spirit to having the veil removed. We all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The key is to contemplate the Lord's glory. By beholding, we are what? Encountering his glory changes everything. Don't worry, 
When I say contemplate, I don't mean to empty our mind. I actually mean that we think, that we think about Jesus, that we imagine the implications of his word for our lives, letting Jesus make himself real to us. Paul suffered hardships, but he was fresh on the inside. He was transformed. He was changed by contemplating Jesus' glory. I think about the Roman soldiers who crucified Jesus, and at that encounter, they left saying, surely he was the Son of God. Their whole perspective on Jesus changed. Story after story in the Bible shows us that encounters with Jesus' glory changes everything. The head pastor from my previous church liked to say that it is impossible for us to sit in the presence of God and not be changed. God's glory changes us. Even when we don't feel like anything's happening, when we open our Bibles, we pray, God is doing something. He is transforming us. I believe that as we contemplate Jesus' life, when we think about his character and wonder about it and pray for it, we will be transformed into his likeness as well. And our life will be a ministry with a message consistent with his, just as Paul's was. We will face every hardship differently. Instead of our worst coming out, it will be an opportunity for Jesus to be revealed. It's difficult to imagine our lives without the hope that we have in Jesus, isn't it? Deanne and I just got the news about a month ago <clears throat> that the reason our son wasn't using his right side as much as his left side is because he had a stroke before he was born. And so he was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Um, because we have Jesus, we have hope. It's a totally different perspective. We know that... Um, regardless of how well he can do with physical therapy, that one day he will be made complete. And Jesus is near in every one of our uh, different trials and circumstances. In our suffering, he is close to us. One final passage I want to read is this. If our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those that are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. My prayer for you is that the fragrance of Christ will be life to you, that you will experience freedom in him as you contemplate Jesus' glorious face. I pray that Satan will not be able to distract or blind or keep you from Jesus. I pray that in the dark parts of our lives, we will let Jesus shine. May your life be transformed and changed by a continual receptivity to the Holy Spirit. And may you reflect Jesus' life and glory and face everywhere you go. And I want to close with some practical suggestions for how you can experience uh, this contemplation. Uh, even today, on the Sabbath, as we uh, have a day that is set aside to draw close to Jesus. Suggestion number one. You guys ready for these? Spend a chunk of time today in the Bible. Not reading a ton of it, but on a smaller portion that you enjoy and asking the Holy Spirit to guide you. We always need to pray that the Holy Spirit will bless our reading of the scripture because he is the one that leads us into all truth. The Bible and the Spirit together are our safeguard because we can make the Bible say whatever we want. You can't get this plane of the spiritual life off the ground without the engine of the Holy Spirit. I recommend, if you need a suggestion for a passage today, John 15, where Jesus talks about abiding in him. That was suggestion number one, spend some time in the Bible meditating on it. Suggestion two, sing to Jesus when it's just you and him. Just a one-on-one -on -one concert for Jesus, <laughs> responding to his love. Suggestion number three, Think about what Satan could be using 
to blind you from the glory of Jesus Christ and think about how much better Jesus is and then just keep thinking about Jesus and how much better he is. Meditate on that. Final suggestion, and this one will be a challenge. Who's up for a challenge? Anybody? Try talking with a friend about what you love about Jesus for 10 minutes. This will be challenging because we are so used to talking about the issues of Christianity or the theology, or, but I want you to talk about the person of Jesus, what you love about him. Deanne and I just did this recently, and it was surprisingly uplifting and encouraging. Finally, if you didn't get anything from this message, or if you only got one thing, I hope it would be that you will turn your eyes to look at Jesus' eyes and know that he in his glory will change you from the inside out because his glory changes everything. God bless you.